your panelists and uh, kicking off this wonderful discussion. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's just so wonderful to see so many people from so many disciplines uh, gathered here. And again, congratulations to my colleague, Sonu, for putting this all together. Uh, we're committed to very brief introductions. It's uh, hard to resist uh, saying something briefly about our next speaker, and that is uh, Victor Zhao. He's an uh, old friend of Stanford's. He was uh, in his many distinguished uh, careers in academic medicine. He was at one time uh, chair of the Department of Medicine at Stanford, also chancellor at Duke, but presently uh, the head of the National Academy of Medicine, truly a great American leader in medicine. My pleasure to welcome to the stage Victor Zha. It's uh, good to be back. Importantly, I want to thank uh, Abraham and Sunu and the committee to invite me uh, to talk about AI health and equity. Now, I'm not an expert in AI. You find out very quickly. Uh, I'm a physician, a scientist, and now a policy and run the academy policymaker, uh, advisor. And in that context, I came to this meeting and I'll be here for the whole meeting because how important the topic is. This topic is vital as a physician, healthcare provider, and someone who's interested, of course, in the issue of equity. Uh, critically important, of course, when we think about what's in the future is the whole issue of where is this place for AI, machine learning, and others in uh, helping us address the issue of health and also of equity. That's why I'm here. So by way of introduction, the National Academy of Medicine, for those who don't know about the organization, is one of the three national academies, National Academy of Science, one of engineering and medicine. And I see your president, Mark Tessio Levine, we are a proud member of our organization, will be here to give you greetings later on. So our job in our national academy, which used to be known as the Institute of Medicine, or IOM, is to look at these issues. And, and to a large extent, we, quote, advise the nation and globally in terms of recommendations, where to go. And I happen to think this is such an important issue because as an academy, we bring together the very best people like Abraham and others uh, to help us think through this so that we can work with all of you to give the right advice and particularly looking at this issue of AI, health and equity. So as an organization, as I said, we used to be known as the IOM. We care about equity in a big way. That's what we do. We want to be sure that everybody, as uh, Tran Hawkins talked about, can achieve good health. Everybody has the opportunity and the right to achieve good health. How do we do that? So i show you some of the reports that we've written. And of course, our reports are read by Congress, by the government executive branch and others, and have influenced policy. And of course, you can see Achieving Equity via the Affordable Care Act, Promise and Perils of Digital Strategies in Achieving Health Equity and others. So over the 50 years, we've been really much, very much immersed in the idea of how do we achieve equity. And we are working with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the Culture of Health. We have a program that looks very much in this issue. Now, the most recent study that we have reported it's actually this one supported by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called Communities in Action, Pathways to Health Equity. I'm gonna give you just one citation in there, which is everyone has the opportunity to attain full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this because of a social position or socially determined circumstance. So what are we talking about? Well, when we think about equity, we really think about two overlapping categories. One is access to health and health care, and secondly, a equitable distribution, if you will, of social, economic, and environmental factors, or inequitable, and how we can overcome them. So my talk is me on both of these issues. First, the access to health care. Well, many of you know many Americans, and as you said globally, have great difficulty in access to health care. Primary care, but also for those who have primary care, specialty care. <clears throat> but there are now many examples where AI can be partial solution to this issue. Using technologies such as retinal scan, 
uh, drones to deliver you know, supplies in rural or remote areas, personal health assistance, digital health, and of course, what you heard earlier, clinical decision support. Now, I just want to say that this AI is already applied in developing countries. Lest you think this is only in the United States, not true. I give you just some examples of AI already applied as ways to deliver care, particularly in people who have no access, easy access to care, in Africa, in India, many other areas. Everybody knows about Zipline, you know, a great way to supply things in remote places of Rwanda, but also many of you know about Verity's retinal scan, as well as others like a 7 up looking at AI point of care diagnosis, triage consultation, et cetera. But I think if you look at this country, as is others, we still, one of the big challenges is access to specialty care. So first, of course, access to primary care, but how do you get consultations when you really are re remote part of the country or remote parts of the world? And this is a new project called Human Diagnostic Project started by a few actually clinicians and of course uh, engineers and software engineers <clears throat> which they do what we call doctors call curbside consult. I got a tough case, I'm gonna ask for a consult. Usually I find the smartest doctor in the room and say, Abraham, what do I do? And he tells me about, oh, you may want to think about this or that. What this is able to do is to, for you to post online using any you know, mobile or other ways uh, the question, the case, has a set of questions you ask and then allows contributors to come in and give you the answer. It's what they call collective intelligence. And when you do that, it actually goes through a specific series of things, puts in an algorithm, and then you get to see what the smart people are saying. And actually, there are 5,000 contributors uh, from, I think, 50, um, from about 40 different specialties and 50 different countries who's now participating in this. Now what it does is also does machine learning because once you know the diagnosis, you put that information back into the system and then machine begin to learn from other cases and then it gets better and better. Now according to the leaders of this, a paper which is now submitted, David Bates and the group at Harvard, that in fact it outperforms the individuals. I haven't seen that data yet, but I think this is certainly encouraging. One way to get special consult. As somebody who ran the health system at Duke and others, I know how difficult it is for networks to get specialty care, even though you may have access to primary care. Because when you think about the bigger, more complex issue, IBM Watson has talked about using, as you know, collecting mega data in cancer and being able to yet another way to say, you can get cancer consultation in places where you don't have easy access to. The very best cancer institutes with that knowledge and the information to help frontline people, primary care physicians, to deal with cancer. Of course, this is still work in progress, and there are some challenges and some controversies, but yet I do think this is going the right way. As pointed out by Jonathan Chan, ultimately, it can give you better care because you'll be able to get better accuracy overall in diagnosis, identifying the predictors so you can guide what treatment, the kind of precision medicine idea, but also reduce the variability of care, adherence to guidelines, improve compliance of the patients, help health literacy, and also importantly, have a mechanism to enroll in clinical trial, particularly of cancer, Many of the cancer treatment are experimental, and having access to this is critically important. Now, what are the concerns? I want to emphasize today that there are lots of things we need to work on, because we hear lots of hypes, but we do need to address these issues so that there are no unintended consequences. One, of course, is the whole issue of digital divide. How many people have access to internet, wearables, et cetera? And I'll show you a little bit of data in this country. Second, of course, is who's gonna pay for it? What if you have no insurance? What if you have insurance, but would the insurance have a large copay? And what if you would barrier to accessing technology be one of insurance, as you know, you know the challenge we face in this country. 
And will we create a two-tier medical system? That is, yeah, you can access electronically for consultation, but trying to see a concierge doctor, rare, more, less and less, because now you have the electronic means, could be a big problem for those who don't have the means. Look at this data, 2016, <clears throat> looking at the digital divide, percent of Americans who have access to high-speed internet. I was quite amazed at this data. If you look at rural population, only 40%. If you're looking at Americans living in tribal areas, 40%. Look at Americans living in US territory, 66%. So you can see that, in fact, we still have a digital divide. And if you look at something that everybody says, everyone has a smartphone, well, not so. If you're not, if you're down and out, you may not be able to afford a smartphone and look at the data. That's quite obvious to you. So we are concerned, not that it should stop us from moving forward, but that we need to achieve equity by making sure that everybody has access to the internet, to phones, etc. Now, the other bigger issue, which is even by far bigger, is addressing the issue of social, economic, and many other factors, which is an inequitable distribution in our country and globally, for, to be sure. And until we address this issue, we're never going to achieve equity. And what does that mean? That is to say, it will require attention to root cause. And our report in the middle East on US, I told you earlier, the 2017 report says, structural racism, discrimination, and poverty. That's why I was so glad to, hear, glad to hear people addressing these issues. But nevertheless, we need to understand the root cause. Therefore, we need data. And therefore, we also need machines to help us to at least provide us with an approach towards improving population health and address disparities. <clears throat> In that regard, population health. To get there, to improve population health and to get equity, we have to think about cross-sectoral collaboration. As you already heard, it's everything else besides healthcare that matters a lot in terms of what determines your health. We need resources to support evidence-based interventions. Unless you have evidence, I don't know what you're deciding on, right? And we need research to provide that evidence, and we need data from all diverse sources and integrate around the patient and the population. Measurements that are meaningful, of course, to communities and governments, and policies, importantly, based on evidence. If I can digress for a second, I wrote an op-ed in Washington Post with Mark Rosenberg after the gun, the last terrible circumstance in Florida, and the fact is, we're making policies without evidence. It's a public health problem. We need to approach it like a public health issue. And then we need to say, what matters? How can we prevent it? So seeing the reflex control and everybody arguing, let's lock up the school, let's do this and that, to me, is lack of evidence. And of course, we need to communicate to the public. So we've been working a lot in gathering data and here's some reports, for example, in looking at how that can inform population health improvement. The last two reports you see there in 2014 is to say, capture social, behavioral, economic domains and information when you care for a patient electronic health record. A minimum starting point where you can actually not only have a data eventually for research, but making decisions because context is so important in achieving health equity. So, if you look at the slide on the right-hand side, the circle, this is the, I would say, seminal work done by Michael McGuinness, who is an executive officer at the Academy, and he wrote back in 1990 or 1980s to say, you know, when you look at health, healthcare is a small percent, 10 percent what determines health. It's everything else from genetics to social, environmental, behavior that can make a difference. What that simply means is that collecting data in healthcare is insufficient, right? Much of the data to improve health and equity has to come from non-health sectors. Where do we live? What do we eat? Do we have jobs? And what's the environment that we function in? So we need a shared data analytics infrastructure 
so you can get timely, relevant, and actionable intelligence to make decisions. That's where I think data and AI is going to come in a big way in achieving health equity. Because if you look at this slide, it says, take state and local data and inform care. First of all, capturing, as we talked about, and incorporating geocoded social determinants into electronic health record, into data sets. Second is to be able to capture things beyond those, which are, in fact, sitting in EPA, in criminal justice court, in housing, et cetera. That information should be captured as well. And of course, private sector data. All those data can be fed in for you to look at trends, patterns, recognizing, and of course, intervention policies and then outcomes. So let me show you one such example using geomarkers or geoinformation system. This paper published in Health Affairs looks at actually in Cincinnati, um, there's five layers. First layer is asthma patients coming to emergency room or hospitalization, but it's also therefore mapped to the neighborhoods, what they call the census tracts in Cincinnati. Second layer is looking at psychological environment, crime rates. Third is looking at economic environment, poverty rates. Fourth is physical environment, housing code violation. And finally, health services, access health service. And when you start mapping this, you'll be able to identify what are all those factors that contribute to the asthma and influence the care of the patient with asthma and being able to begin to make interventions, whether you're doing public health interventions or when a patient arrives in the emergency room and you can identify whether the patient maps to this, you'll be able to send in healthcare workers and other interventions in their environment. Now, that is kind of done, but as Jonathan said, it's done on a one-off basis today. But imagine what you can do when you have all this. So when I was at Duke, we actually took this same approach looking at diabetes. Since at Duke, we we uh, were responsible for 90, 95% of the Durham population. It was easy to map hemoglobin A1C, shown over here on the right side. And the, high, the darker, of course, is high level of hemoglobin A1C that's elevated. That means that diabetes is not controlled. We're able to map on the left side where the grocery stores are, where the clinics are, and all those things in order to really be able to make interventions where to place the right uh, you know, access to good food, where to place the clinics, et cetera. Now, now when you imagine bringing geospatial mapping technology with machine learning and AI, that is going to be really powerful in the future. And this is what I want to kind of emphasize how important it is for us to think about this direction. So when you think about equity, achieve equity requires data, and action across multiple stakeholders, not just healthcare, all sectors, transportation, housing, you name it. Therefore, the problem today in approaching health equity is that we actually took each factor and look at them separately. Why? Because our measurements are different. When I talk about poverty, I talk about dollars. When I talk about food security, I talk about calories. What AI can do is to integrate these many different streams and multi-solve approach to look at co-benefits. It can draw on new sources of data and inform decision making, and of course, importantly, vulnerability assessment for say for the population. And finally, a mathematical modeling. Remember I talked about decision making? It can allow you to at least look at a means to model the decisions to see, in fact, is evidence-based. AI can also be useful in disease surveillance. You know, what's really exciting is a, um, a AI actually uh, um, is a company that actually has collected a massive amount of data on opioids. About f 4 million providers, about 50 million patients in 50 states, and 1 billion data set, diagnostic sets. And they begin to use machine learning to look at what are the predictors for misuse and use, et cetera. And now it's been applied to Indiana as a way to look at how to mitigate 
areas of potential overdose, et cetera. It can gain insights into public asset, public health awareness, virtual assistance, and of course, wearables to measure your environment. Now, concerns. You've heard my learned colleague earlier about the concerns. And particularly, I believe Emma talked about how important the data is and the quality of data. Well, the problem is we all recognize it is the quality of data that you, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? And you need mass amount of data. And as been reviewed by many people, but this one from Harvard Business Review, the problem is that demands of learning are steep and bad data can easily creep into what you want to do, either is the training set, the predictive model, or the data you apply in order to make future decisions. And so without going through all that detail, which I'm sure we can discuss, the big concern is, are we using biased data whereby, in fact, inadvertently, people are going to be harmed by this? I think there's a really good example in the criminal justice system. ProPublica look at this particular investigation looking at risk assessment in criminal sentencing using an algorithm, taking in the information, and the data, they took a look at it, and it's only 20% reliable to predict who's likely to be rearrested uh, in the future. But worse still is the tremendous bias in the racial bias, in which the blacks are more likely to be flagged for a stronger sentence, and because they're likely to be, by prediction, to be uh, rearrested, uh, uh, to, to uh, to uh, break the law again, whereas in the white population, it's just the other way around. So you can imagine in many of these data, depending on the data set that you use, you can actually have bad consequences. Um, uh, I think, was it Emma or someone mentioned about the randomized control trial? Well, randomized control trial in my world, I, I used to be a hypertension expert, cardiovascular, are really collecting data in a very controlled setting Right? between co the control versus experimental with one variable or so, and importantly, the massive amount are really on white men. So you can imagine that the data which you're going to use, evidence-based, if you will, to make decisions, are actually very skewed and biased. And that's where the great concern is, as you can see from these two publications uh, mentioning this. So. We also worry about automation. Uh, Virginia Eubanks wrote this very important book. Yes, there you go. Hi, how are you? Well, you can talk about this. <laughs> but I would say the big concern is once you remove a human being from this, there's no judgment, compassion, et cetera. So while I agree with what's been said earlier that we can make precise decision, that importance of Consciousness is so important in our determination, which no machine can substitute. So, Virginia, I'll let you talk about this, but except I thought the example in Medicaid of this young lady who had ovarian cancer, who actually got a note to say, you need to recertify your Medicaid. She made the phone call, she was in the hospital, not able to do it, and machines come back and say, failure to cooperate, you're out. Right? This is a big concern as we convert into automation, machines, et cetera. And of course, in addition to all those things I talked about, perpetuating bias reflects structural racism, and then the consequences of automation are many issues of a vulnerable population. Fair enough, we talked about earlier the studies of people who are at risk, vulnerable. But look at, they are greater at risk for problems with ethics, data ownership, privacy, security, et cetera. And finally, I want to take two other slides. One is align incentive alignment. Much of AI is driven by commercial sources. So, you know, when we converted, I'm talking about Duke, but everybody else over to electronic health record, the doctors, many of them realized this is really just getting administrative billing data, coding data, all that stuff, right? And what about the patient? And take me away from patient. When you think about the incentive of creating AI in the commercial sector, many of these are really aligned more with, of course, payment and other issues. It's really important that AI think about public health, population health, and the public good. And how do we make sure we align that incentive 
is the, few, is the issue. Second, of course, is workforce. I'm sure we talked about the need of workforce. Here are two publications that we did at the Academy about workforce for the future. Workforce now really had to be very savvy with at least the use of the internet, data science, and others. But also, we are increasingly concerned about diversity or lack of diversity of workforce. So those issues need to be addressed. My final slide, you don't have to read this. I guess finish telling you there are lots of pros and there's lots of blinking light caution, and we need to do that. And the reason that I'm here, and I'm here all day, I, I got in last night at 1 a.m., and I'm taking a red eye back today, Abraham. <laughs> But I think this is such important. I think you guys do great. We'd love to collaborate with you. Here's a list of things we're working on at the National Academy, thinking through what do we need to do? How do we play in this space? I want to highlight a few things at the end. <clears throat> For example, we have a strategic plan. I'm sure you read everything of it, right, Abraham? <laughs> and one of our plan, goal number three, is to say, what is the future of science and technology and health? and how do we look at societal impact and others. That's our responsibility. That's what we like to work with all of you. And Sunu is leading our leadership consortium on AI machine learning working group. And we're working with the General Accounting Office, GAO, which of course advised Congress, on a report on AI in areas of diagnostics, healthcare, and also in innovation. Where I'm moving forward is I'm creating a cross-academy. Uh, we, with my other presidents, are doing cross-academy issues, looking at not only within health, but how does this cross sectors between engineering and science. And importantly, I'm also putting together a committee on emerging science, technology, and innovation to explicitly look at some of these issues. It's a broad remit, but I think when you think about gene editing, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AI, well, I mean, I'm an optimist. Health and healthcare will be really transformed. But are we ready? Are we preparing ourselves to be sure we get away from unintended consequences? That's what I'm here. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.